kids, Miss Kulkarni here. In this video, we will talk about Lewis dot structures for atoms, ions, and also ionic compound. So, what are Lewis dot structure? A scientist named Lewis came up with this idea, and he actually represented every single element, the atom of that element, ion, and also ionic covalent compounds in the form of dots around the elements and that came to be known as Lewis dot structures. So how do we draw a Lewis dot structure? There are a couple of steps. Let's begin with step number one. We identify the element or elements and for each of the atom we find out valence electrons. And if there are more than one atom, then we are going to find out the total sum of the valence electrons. And what do we use for that? We use periodic table for the reference purpose. Then, if it is an ion with negative charge, we are going to add an electron for every single charge. So, if it is negative 1 as a charge, we add 1 electron. And if it is positive charge, then we subtract the electron. So let's say maybe we have positive charge for the ion. You are going to subtract two electrons from the total number. After we get the total count of electrons, step number two is write down the symbol for that particular element. And then you're going to put the valence electrons all around it. And for ions, we are going to put the symbol, place the electrons after it's forming the ion. And main important thing is draw the brackets. I call it like a house. So ions will have a house to live in. And of course, don't forget the charge or superscript. It will tell you if the ion has positive or negative charge and also the value. So let's learn how to draw a Lewis dot structure. We have an element given here as tin. For tin, the symbol is Sn. Let's locate where tin is in the periodic table. And if you look carefully, that's where we find out tin. That is group number 14. And if it's group number 14, the valence electron are 4. So if we have 4 valence electrons, we are going to show those as four dots around tin. That is your symbolic representation of tin atom. If you actually go back and identify those valence electrons, they come from 5s2 and 5p2. Tin can lose all four electrons or it can only lose two p electrons. If it loses all four, we end up getting positive four. And if it loses only two, we end up getting positive two as the charge. So if tin loses two electrons out of those four, how many will be remaining? There will be two remaining, and that gives rise to tin ion. Remember again, the ion needs to have parenthesis bracket there and the charge will be positive 2 because 2 electrons are lost. If tin loses all 4 electrons, it will not have any valence electrons around it. So that's the way we will write tin ion if it loses all 4 electrons and the charge will be positive 4. So you got it. It's simple. You look at the element in the periodic table based upon the group number. You are going to identify how many electrons are there as valence electrons. And then if it loses, it's going to have positive charge. If it gains, it's going to have that corresponding negative charge. It is that simple. So here are some more problems about Lewis dot structure. Let's talk about the first one. There is lithium ion. And if you look at the periodic table, lithium is right over here in group number one. So that means lithium will have 
one valence electron. So if I want to draw a Lewis dot structure for lithium, I will write lithium and there will be only one single electron around lithium. What happens when lithium forms an ion? It has one electron using octet rule. It will try to lose to complete the octet. So lithium will end up having no electrons around it. It's an ion now. So we are going to put the parenthesis and since it loses one electron, we will get positive one charge. Let's look at our next example, boron. And boron is right over here. That is group number 13. So that means we have three valence electrons. So that's boron symbol B. And we are going to write down three electrons for boron. Now what happens when boron ion is formed? Elements from group 13 tend to lose those three electrons. So if boron loses three electrons, there will be no electrons remaining around it. So we'll get an ion with a charge, positive charge, because electrons are lost. And since three electrons are lost, it will be positive three. And we move on to the next one. For next one, it is oxygen. Let's go back and find oxygen. That is in group number 16. So group 16 will have six electrons as valence electron. So if that is our oxygen, we're going to show six electrons around that. And you always try to balance it. So we get two electrons together in form of pairs. So that's the oxygen atom. And for oxide ion, it will be gaining two electrons. So what do we get? So we will have an oxygen and those initial six electrons and then it's going to actually gain two electrons. So that's the way it's going to look like. And after that, we need to make sure it's an ion. So we have square bracket and then it's gaining two electrons. The charge is negative two. So basically, if you find out the location of every element and get the number of valence electron, it is very easy to draw a Lewis dot structure for an atom and we can predict if it's going to lose or gain and we can complete the same structure for an ion. So here are the answers for remaining questions. Look at bismuth. Bismuth has five valence electron because it's in group number 15 and when bismuth plus three ion is forming, it means it is losing three electrons. That gives me positive three charge and out of five, Three are gone, two electrons are still there. For antimony, again, it's in group number 15. And if antimony forms plus five ion, that means it's going to lose all five. If that happens, it will not have any electrons around it and the charge will be positive five. Phosphorus, phosphorus again comes in group number 15. So we'll have five electrons around P. Phosphide ion is going to gain three electrons. And if it gains three electrons, we end up having eight octet complete. Charge will be negative three. Iodine had seven electrons because it is group number 17. Iodide ion will be gaining one electron. And with that, it makes the complete octet with charge as negative one. Xenon comes in group 18 and as you know group 18 has eight electrons as valence electrons so we show all those around xenon and of course it will be stable and won't form an ion. Helium is a little tricky. Helium is in period one and if you look at the atomic number the atomic number is two that means helium only has two electrons. It is still considered a noble gas. This is the only exception when a gas is called noble gas. It does not have octet, but he, it has two electrons in the very first orbit. And that's it. Since we already know how to draw Lewis dot structure for an atom and ion, it's going to be very easy to draw a Lewis dot structure for ionic compounds. 
each ionic compound will have positive and negative ions. So the steps include drawing Lewis dot structures for both positive and negative ions along with the charge and don't forget the brackets. After that is done, you have to make sure the total charge on the compound is zero. So we need to make sure how many positive and negative ions we must have. In this example with magnesium chloride, we have magnesium and chloride ion. And for magnesium ion, there were two electrons in the atom which are lost. So magnesium becomes positive two. And for chlorine, we had seven electrons for the atom. It's going to gain. So each chlorine ends up having negative one charge. So we have positive two, negative one, and negative one as the charge. So the total charge will be addition of each individual charge, and that will be zero. So we saw we are using one magnesium ion and two chloride atoms. That's why we end up having the formula MgCl2. For sodium chloride, we have two different ions, sodium ion and chloride ion. Sodium is in group 1, so the ion will be positive 1. And chlorine is in group 17, that means the, when, when it forms the ion, it's going to gain one electron, so chloride will be Cl minus 1. How do we write down the Lewis dot structure? It is the Lewis dot structure for sodium ion and chloride ion. Now, this is not completely done. We still need to write the electrons. Sodium ion is formed after the atom loses one electron. So, in the outermost orbit here, we are not going to show any of the electrons. Chlorine already had seven and now when it forms the ion, it is going to gain one extra one. So, that's the chloride ion. Okay. Now, let's look at the charge. It's positive one for sodium and negative one for chloride ion. Total equal to zero. That's what we want. And the formula for the compound will be one sodium ion and one chloride ion. So, it will be NaCl. We can work on the remaining compounds in same manner. And what do we get? Calcium is positive two and fluoride is negative one. So we can do some simple math and with that we can figure out that we need one ion of calcium but we need two ions which give you negative one charge. And then calcium ion is formed by loss of two electrons so there are no electrons around calcium versus fluoride ion is formed by gain of electrons so then it will have an octate complete. So that brings us back to the formula. We need one calcium ion but two fluoride ions, so formula is CaF2. The last one is a little tricky. We have aluminum oxide. Aluminum is positive 3 because it's group number 13 and oxygen is negative 2, it's group number 16. So we need two ions with positive 3 charge and we need three ions with charge negative 2. After we figure out we need three ions of oxygen and two ions of aluminum, it was very simple. We just arranged them so that they are alternate to each other. So that brings us back to the formula. We have two aluminum and three oxides. So the formula is Al2O3. Let's wrap up the video with the properties of ionic compounds. Very first thing, ionic compounds have high melting point and boiling point because they have ion-ion interactions which are quite strong and that need some extra energy. Also, they are solids at room temperature most of the time. And then second thing is they are brittle, they can cleave when struck easily. That is caused because there is ion-ion repulsion. Next one is many but not all ionic compounds are soluble in water. And you know why they are soluble? 
because they have partial charges on water. We will talk more about the polarity later. But right now remember, they have partial charges on water. Then, okay, about the conductivity, they are non-conductive as solids. But in molten state or in aqueous solutions, they will be very good conductors. And that's because ions are easily able to move around and that allows electron movement too. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you again in next video. Until then, bye-bye.